piece ago. Um, well, thank you, thank you all for uh, coming on this uh, cold Massachusetts night. Um, uh, a little bit about me. Um, the book came out about a year ago, uh, and since then, uh, marijuana has consumed my life, although not in the usual way. Um, uh, I'm not really the person who should be up here, in a way. Uh, I'm, not a, I'm not a doctor, I'm not an MD, I'm not a PhD, I haven't spent my life in public health, I'm not a, a police chief uh, or police officer. Um, what I am really is a journalist. Uh, and I got into this because uh, my wife is a forensic psychiatrist. And uh, for those of you who don't know what that is, uh, a forensic psychiatrist is somebody who specializes in um, treating and really evaluating the criminally mentally ill. So if you commit a terrible crime and uh, you raise an insanity defense, she um, would evaluate you or will evaluate you to see if you're actually mentally ill, um, how that mental illness might have played a role in the crime, uh, and whether or not you can be treated, and, uh, and you know, ultimately stepped down to civil confinement, what, what, your, you know, what your ultimate um, uh, trajectory will be. And she uh, ran, and she actually trained at Harvard um, for a number of years uh, before uh, moving uh, to New York um, uh, after we met. True story, we met in Boston. Uh, we met uh, uh, at a bar in Boston. They say you cannot meet your wife in a bar, but, uh, but we actually did. Um, uh, and that was, uh, that was uh, 13 years ago. Um, but so she, uh, she, for a number of years, um, ran a forensic hospital in New York State. So if you are found not guilty by reason of insanity, um, uh, you will be sent to a forensic hospital, which is, uh, which is really a prison disguised as a hospital. And I remember the first time I, uh, I drove over to you know, where she worked, uh, you know, the place really did look like something out of a horror movie. It's all these sort of old brick buildings surrounded by barbed wire. And I said, it looks like a prison. And she looked at me as if I was an idiot and said, these people are mentally ill murderers. <laughs> what, what, what do you think? Um, you know, it's, it's, not the, it's not a hospital, even though it's called a hospital. But anyway, she, uh, so she uh, was a psychiatrist there and rose to become the director of forensics uh, at this institution called the Mid-Hudson Forensic Psychiatric uh, Institute um, in, in Orange County, New York. And, uh, and she would come home and, you know, it's, it's grueling work to, you know, to evaluate these folks and, uh, and uh, you know, make decisions, you're making decisions about whether or not somebody is, you know, is sane enough to be released back into the community or into a uh, less secure facility after having done something horrible most of the time. Um, you know, you don't want to be wrong either way. And so, uh, but she would come back and, uh, you know, we had probably too much conversation about people hacking people up. And it struck me that um, over, uh, over a period of years this was, she was constantly talking about how cannabis played a role in, these, uh, in the, in the you know, psych psychiatric deterioration of these people. Um, and oftentimes that they had been using at the time of the crime, certainly that they had been using in the months and years leading up to the crime. And, um, to be honest with you, I, you know, I was a reporter, I'd been a reporter for the New York Times until I left in 2010 to become a novelist. Um, thank you to the gentleman who, uh, who said that he uh, knew me from the novels. I, I, always, I always appreciate that. Um, but uh, uh, I'd become a, a novelist, um, even though I'd never really lost the journalism bug. And uh, I didn't really have a particular interest in cannabis, and I certainly didn't have much of a political view about legalization. And this sort of sounded like reefer madness to me. And you know, I told her that a few times. And finally, she got tired of me mansplaining on this when I knew nothing about it. Um, you know, since she was the one who trained at Harvard and Columbia, and she was the one who actually saw these people. And she told me to go read the studies. And, um, and so I did. Um, and it turned out that she was right, of course. Um, and so the, you know, sort of the, the, the most important book that I read at the beginning of my research was, and I unfortunately I didn't bring it, I have this dog-eared copy of, the, uh, of a report that was released in early 2017 from the National Academy of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine. NASM is the group that we, uh, you know, in the United States ask to answer really important scientific and medical questions for us. So when people say, well, vaccines cause autism, Congress says to NASM, 
go, go, dis, you know, go tell us if that's true or not. And um, you know, so they'll, they'll put a committee together and they'll have researchers and they'll look at all the research that's been done over the years um, and they'll try to come up with a, you know, with a scientifically valid answer. Um, and so, uh, you know, the NASM findings are, were in this, you know, nearly 500 page report all about sort of the medical benefits of cannabis, which were clearly pretty limited, and the psychiatric risks and other harms, which, which were clearly pretty severe. Um, and I thought to myself, this is, you know, this is not Joe's newsletter. This is the most important, uh, you know, scientific advisory board in the, in the United States, arguably in the world, putting this out, and nobody's heard of this. Because you know, it, was, it was probably late 2017 maybe, when, I, when, I, when I came upon this. Um, and, uh, and there were no articles about it. There had been nothing in the New York Times. You know, there, was, there, was, there was literally almost nothing written after this thing came out. And, uh, and so I said to myself, OK, there's two stories here. And one of them is the easy one, which is good, because I'm not a scientist. I can read scientific papers. But it's good that it's well documented because I don't have the PhD, I don't have the MD. And that is the story of what cannabis actually does to the brain. Fortunately, a lot of really smart people have figured this out. So I, you know, so I can tell people what they've said. And second is a story that I am pretty qualified to tell, which is a story about journalism and the media and the failure of journalism and the media to publicly communicate what the scientists know and why that happened. And you know, I, you know, having had been a reporter for more than 15 years and been at the Times for 10 years, I did have and do have a pretty good understanding of how the media works. So the book, the book is really two books in one. It is, it is a hopefully uh, you know easy to understand capsule uh, discussion of the science around cannabis and mental illness, and and then you know more controversially around cannabis and violence and um, and there you know I, I will I want to be clear that the science around cannabis and mental illness is much more settled uh, than the science around cannabis and violence and it's also a reason it's also sort of explaining to you why don't you know this why 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 does this sound so insane to so many reasonably well educated people that you know that who, that this that you've literally never heard most of this before. Um, and, and frankly, uh, I think to some people in the drug policy community, that second part is actually more interesting than the first, to, you know, to the psychiatrists, the people who know, who know the science. In some ways, the second part is more interesting than the first. Um, so uh, so let's, let's talk um, a little bit about the science and what it actually says. And, um, the you know the slides. This is not it's not a de it's not a super detailed presentation. Um, but even before I get to the issues around cannabis and schizophrenia um, and cannabis and violence, I, I want to talk a little bit about two, in some ways easier to understand and broader I issues that may even be more societally important and broad. And the first is cannabis and driving. Um, so and, and and you know last week I was talking to a bunch of uh, basketball players in West Virginia. Um, and, I, and I said to them, look, if you come away with this, from this, with one thing, come away with an understanding that if somebody is high and asks you to get in the car with them, don't do it, okay? It's, it's, it's I'm not gonna say it's just as dangerous as getting in a car with somebody who's really drunk. The evidence does not necessarily support that, but it's plenty dangerous. And unfortunately, there's increasing real world evidence of that, and, and, and I'll get to that. And you know, I'd say, unfortunately, there aren't that many kids in this audience. There are some, some you know, teenagers, and, but parents do not encourage your kids to think of al as cannabis as a safe substitute for alcohol for people who are gonna be driving. It it's just does not seem to be the case. Um, you know, and, and, and there's, you know, as with a lot of stuff with cannabis, in the last 10 or 15 years, things seem to have changed. That, um, you know, there was this perception that people just drove really slowly and were, uh, you know, were really cautious and a little bit paranoid and, uh, and didn't get into accidents. And if they did, they were really minor accidents. And that, for, that is no longer the case. Um, uh, you know, I know there was the, the state trooper who was killed uh, here not that long ago. And, you know, and, and ultimately, I think that case was resolved with a with a guilty verdict, but not a guilty verdict on cannabis intoxication, which is which is very strange. And um, and one of the you know one of the many problems with legalization is it creates this gray zone 
for, uh, for driving under the influence, especially because the cannabis lobby has very, very successfully argued that, well, we don't really know, and some people have different levels of tolerance. I urge you to consider what the response would be if the spirits industry said, well, people who are really alcoholics, they can drink at a much higher BAC, or they can drive safely at a much higher BAC than most people, so we can't have a bright line standard. I mean, they would be, they would be kicked into the, you know, into the Atlantic if they tried that, but the cannabis uh, lobby say that with a straight face, and they have been pretty successful, and I don't know if there's a, a five nanogram per milliliter, uh, there's not, okay. So there's no bright line standard in, the, uh, in, in Massachusetts, and that's really bad, because it means people will use and, um, and, the, and, the, and even if they get an accident, sometimes they can't be uh, prosecuted. But it means there's a real misperception around, the, around cannabis and driving. And so I'm, I'm, I'm leading with that because uh, I think it's really important. And uh, you know, it, some of the science around schizophrenia, some of the science around violence, some of these issues are complicated and controversial. And so I sort of want to, I want to set that aside. And the, and the other, issue that I want to set aside uh, is to talk about cannabis and opioids. Um, because there is a, there's a campaign out there. I, I, when I was in Denver, uh, I guess it was last year, um, you know, Weed Maps was putting up, uh, putting up billboards saying uh, states that uh, have medical marijuana have fewer opioid overdose deaths. Um, and that they are, they, they, the industry pushes this and it is a lie. Okay, it is, it is unequivocally a lie. Um, in fact, there's now, so, so that, that particular lie comes from a paper that came out in 2014, and this I go into in the book, um, around medical marijuana laws and opioids that was published in JAMA Internal Medicine. Okay, that's a legitimate paper, it's peer reviewed, nobody's really disputed the data. Here's the problem with the paper. So what the paper found, what the, what the research found was that states that had medical marijuana laws seemed to have fewer opioid overdose deaths. Okay. Here, before, before I sort of give you the punchline on this, here's the problem with that. Trying to impute any kind of state level changes to something as, uh, as on an issue that's as multifactorial as opioid overdoses from, from cannabis laws or any other single factor is really hard to do. It's basically an epidemiologic no-no. Okay, so, so a state could have a rise in cannabis deaths, I'm sorry, a rise in opioid overdose deaths because suddenly, um, you know, a new trafficker came to the state one year and literally, uh, you know, started offering fentanyl. It could have a decrease because it, it, it had a prescription drug monitoring program in place that was a good one. It could have, it could have an increase simply out of geographic um, uh, coincidence, which, by the way, appears to be the, what really happened in the United States in the, in the first uh, decade of the, the, the 2000s and the aughts. The opioid overdose epidemic started in Appalachia and unfortunately you know, ran up to the Northeast and then down to Florida. Cannabis laws were passed in the West. Medical marijuana started in the West, okay? So this groundbreaking paper that, that has been cited hundreds of times and advertised everywhere probably is just a geographic artifact because the data in that paper only goes through 2009, okay? It's a, it's a decade old, the data in that paper. And, and in the book, uh, a researcher and I tried to update it, and what we found was the effect disappeared. And that researcher then collaborated with a couple other people, and I had nothing to do with the paper that was published last June in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, but if you read that paper, the 2019 paper, the effect that was found five years ago didn't just go away, it actually reversed. In other words, states with medical marijuana laws actually had more opioid overdose deaths when you look at the more recent data. So, so what does that mean? It means probably that there is no connection at all between medical marijuana and opioid overdose deaths. And, and it, to the extent there may be a connection, it's a connection in the positive sense. In other words, medical marijuana probably drives up opioid overdose. Well, what would the mechanism for action for that be? It probably is 
that people who like getting high wind up trying other substances that get them high. That's pharmacologically makes sense. It's, uh, it's culturally logical. It's logical in a number of ways. And the best way to track individual drug use is to track individuals and their drug use. And guess what? When you do that, you find that people who use marijuana, if you look at them three years later, are much more likely to be using over, uh, opioids. And people who use, uh, people who have a problem with marijuana, with cannabis, three years later, are much more likely to have a problem with opioids, okay? And you find that people who use cannabis over a multi-year period, I'm sorry, people who use opioids over a multiple year period and also use cannabis don't report less pain than people who are just using opioids. Cannabis is not an off-ramp for most people's opioid use. I'm not saying it can never happen, because clearly there are idiosyncratic cases where people manage somehow to stop using opioids because of cannabis. But if you look at the data, and the data is what we should look at when we're talking about public health, and when we're trying to make decisions about public health, it goes the other way. People who use cannabis are more likely to use opioids later. Anybody who, and, and on a statewide level, there's no association between medical marijuana and opioids, and to the extent there is an association, it's a positive association. So anybody who tells you otherwise is lying. They're lying because they don't know the data and they haven't bothered, or more likely, they're cynically lying because they're relying on a paper that's out of date instead of telling you the truth about what the more accurate science has found. And, and, and one sort of final point on cannabis as a pain reliever. So, States that have passed medical marijuana laws generally um, allow the use of pain as a qualifying condition. So I, you know, I, I, I don't know if anybody in here has an authorization card or knows how that process works, but it is nothing like going to the doctor and getting a real prescription. When you go to the doctor and you're sick, you generally get a prescription for a medicine. You know, you, I, I go on, I have a sore throat, I have the flu. I get a prescription for Tamiflu. I go, to the, I go to the pharmacy and fill it. I take the Tamiflu, that's it. Maybe I go back to the doctor to see you know, if my flu is resolved or not. Um, if, even if I'm taking something for a chronic condition, like I go to the doctor and I have high blood pressure um, or, or I have high cholesterol, he prescribes me a statin. I go to you know, the, the Walgreens and I get 30 days or 90 days of that prescription and Maybe I don't have to go back after 90 days, but I still, you know, I still have to call in and get a new prescription. Okay, when you go get your medical marijuana prescription, it's not a prescription at all. It's an authorization, meaning some doctor is gonna ask you if you have one of a laundry list of conditions that, uh, that qualifies for an authorization, and if you're dumb enough or too stoned to say yes, he's gonna ask you again until you say yes. And then you're going to walk out with a card that says you can buy cannabis for the next year. It's not going to tell you that you're supposed to take it in the morning or you're supposed to take this strain or, or you know, this strength. It's just going to tell you you can buy cannabis without being arrested. Okay? It is in every way a, a, a device to legalize recreational marijuana use under medical, uh, the, under the, under uh, the, the, concealment of medicine, okay? And, and that's the truth. Um, when we look at the conditions, the only condition that really has widespread, uh, uh, that is widespread for which there's also decent evidence that cannabis works, it's pain. Okay, pain, cannabis, uh, if you look at, there's a, there's a, there was a paper that came out in JAMA, not JAMA Internal Medicine, uh, in 2000, I think it was 15, that looked at various studies and it found that if you massage the data a little bit, you could, you could show that cannabis actually worked as a pain reliever. Not, not smoke cannabis, uh, a THC, uh, and, and for those of you who don't know, although in this audience I guess most of you do, THC is the psychoactive ingredient in cannabis. It's the chemical that gets people high. Um, there was a THC, CBD, and CBD, in deference to, uh, to Judy, who's in the audience, who insisted that I not say that uh, CBD is non-psychoactive. CBD is the non-intoxicating primary chemical in cannabis. So there's a company called GW Pharma. GW Pharma is a British pharmaceutical company that has for 20 years been trying to get um, various cannabis products uh, uh, approved by the FDA. It's a real company. They do real research. And they spent a lot of time and money 
investigating whether this THC CBD blend, which is called Sativex, and it's a spray, it's a nasal spray, or maybe it may be a spray in your mouth, I'm sorry, um, uh, could treat pain. Because everyone in this audience knows what the market for a non-opioid painkiller that actually worked would be, right? I mean, given the opioid crisis, you can imagine it'd be tens of billions of dollars. It certainly would be billions of dollars. It'd be a huge market. And, and it is the GW Pharma data that led to this JAMA paper that led scientists to say, okay, it looks like cannabis does treat pain. Uh, or at least this, this THC CBD blend treats pain. Unfortunately, since 2015, there have been more studies done to see if Sativex, to see if THC treats pain, and they've failed. They've failed not against, not against opioids, okay, cannabis definitely doesn't work as well as opioids to treat pain. And they haven't even failed against things like Advil or Tylenol or over-the-counter painkillers. They've failed against placebo. In other words, if you give people water or this spray, there is no measurable difference in their reduction in pain, which is actually shocking even to me because if you, if you give people alcohol, it dulls their pain, right? Before there were opioid painkillers, when people had to you know, do crude surgery or whatever, they, got, they, they would be given alcohol to try to, you know, to try to numb them a little bit. But cannabis doesn't actually even seem to work for pain, okay? I suspect the reason for that is that where alcohol dulls sensation and increases emotion, you know, you, you can think of happy drunks or, or angry drunks, cannabis does the reverse, right? It dulls emotion, it sort of puts people, it makes them dissociate a little bit, and at the same time, it improves sensation, which is why people like to you know, use it when they're listening to music, or when they're eating, or when they're having sex. It, 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 it enhances sensation. But if you're in pain, maybe enhancing sensation is not the best idea for you. In any case, cannabis doesn't actually work as a pain reliever, which is probably why it doesn't work to get people off opioids, and is definitely why GW Pharma has stopped chasing this, uh, this pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. They actually don't, they're not even trying to get Sativex approved for pain anymore because they couldn't do it. So if you need any evidence that cannabis and THC are not effective painkillers, that's all you need to know. The companies that have billions of dollars at stake trying to get it approved have given up because it doesn't work. Okay, so cannabis is bad if you drive and it's not, uh, it's not in any way a solution to the opioid epidemic. Um, now, cannabis, mental illness, and violence. So there's a long history of this, and a lot of it's in the book. Um, uh, and I, um, I, don't, I don't, I could spend an hour just talking about the major studies. I'm not going to, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to bore you with it. Um, I'm going to say two things. I brought copies of the book. This is the hardcover. Um, it doesn't have the bibliography. Uh, some of you may want to buy it. Most of you probably won't. I also brought copies of the bibliography. I only, unfortunately, have five of them. If you don't want to buy the book, take a bibliography and see. It's, it's 17 pages long. There's 170 references in it. The paperback, when it comes out in, Jan in February, is going to have the full bibliography in it. It was a mistake of mine not to have it in, in, the, in the hardcover. Um, and see for yourself. Pick a study. Pick two. See if they say what I say they say. And see if they give you a positive impression of cannabis's impacts on mental illness or violence. Um, because, because people have criticized the book for cherry picking. But there isn't, there, I didn't cherry pick. The data says what I says, say it did. It's just that nobody has heard it before, and it hasn't been assembled in one place before. Um, and, and again, if you don't want to buy the book, great, but take a bibliography. Um, so people have, been, people have been talking about cannabis and mental illness for 150 years. Basically, as soon as what, there were called, what the British called insane asylums, which we now call psychiatric hospitals, as soon as those opened up, in India, which was a, you know, a, a country that had a fairly large population of cannabis users in the, in the 1800s, as soon as those asylums opened up, the British doctors who ran them noticed that they were getting filled with people who were using cannabis and blamed cannabis for their mental illness. Um, and they wrote about it. And, uh, and 
And they didn't have uh, you know, big epidemiologic studies, but they wrote about what they were seeing. Um, but the first real study came in 1987, and uh, this came out of Sweden. And what happened was the Swedes had a, had a draft. Um, and uh, you know, this, isn't, this wasn't the US where if you were politically connected, you could dodge it. Sweden, every male uh, you know, who was 18 or 19 got conscripted for a year. And they were asked questions about their drug use, um, which they seemed to have answered honestly when, uh, when, when people went back and looked at the data. And, and so 18 years after, uh, after the class of 69 had been conscripted, a guy named Sven Andreessen, a doctor, a psychiatrist, a Swedish psychiatrist who's still alive today, decided he was going to look at what had happened to, uh, to that class and to the cannabis users in it, and if there was a link between cannabis and schizophrenia. Um, so, so now I need to backtrack again. Psychosis, what is psychosis? Um, psychosis is the term that, people, that psychiatrists use when somebody's had a break from reality. Okay, so psychosis, it could be hallucinations, delusions, hearing voices, um, they could be visual, they're more likely to be auditory, uh, paranoia is also a very common feature of psychosis. Uh, you know, in, in severe cases, people can, can become catatonic, they can lose the ability to speak. Um, but mainly, you know, a sort of run-of-the-mill case of psychosis would be auditory hallucinations and paranoia. Um, so if, if you go to the ER because you're suffering from that for some, you know, a, 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 the, the, probably the first question you're gonna they're going to ask you is whether you're using drugs. Many different things can cause psychosis. Uh, in, including severe, really severe stress can cause psychosis, um, uh, drugs can cause psychosis, um, and you know, organic causes such as uh, Alzheimer's disease actually can cause psychosis, or brain tumors can cause psychosis. Psychosis, it's a breakdown in the functioning of the mind. Okay. Hopefully your psychosis will resolve in a few days, and hopefully it will not come back. If it does not resolve for six months or more, you may wind up with a diagnosis of schizophrenia. Um, uh, you might also, depending, you might also wind up with a di uh, diagnosis of bipolar disorder with psychosis. Um, and to some extent, that'll be depending on how you know, connected your family is and how hard they fight a diagnosis of schizophrenia, because schizophrenia is a bad diagnosis and people try to avoid it. Um, regardless, schizophrenia means basically a permanent psychotic condition. And there's a lot of argument about this among really smart doctors and researchers who say that really we should rename schizophrenia as psychosis spectrum disorder because some people seem to get terrible, uh, you know, have terrible uh, schizophrenia for a period of years and then they recover. We don't know why. Some people it goes on and on and on. In general, if you are diagnosed with schizophrenia, you're going to be diagnosed between 18 and 25 and your life is going to be pretty miserable. Not always. Some people recover. But... Uh, most people with schizophrenia, they don't get married, they don't have kids, they don't work. It is a disabling chronic condition for a lot of people. Um, and so, and, and, and it is also, you're also likely to wind up, you know, coming to the attention of the public health authorities or law enforcement or both over the, you know, over the course of your illness. Because if you're hearing voices and, you know, think people are out to get you and that goes on for a long time, you're likely to behave in ways that, uh, you know, that, that get you in trouble. Or, or at least get you needing to be medicated. So, Sweden, national healthcare system, um, very good data, population registry, things we don't have in the US. So, Dr. Andreessen was able to look at what had happened to people, I think it was actually in 83, even though the study was published in 87, 14 years later, 14 years after they were conscripted. And, and what he found, I'm, I'm really a PowerPoint simpleton, so I make simple slides. Um, it speaks for itself. Uh, if you'd never used, you had a baseline risk of, of one, you were, which I think translated into about half a percent, one person in 200 was later uh, diagnosed with schizophrenia. If you'd used more than 50 times, you had about a 3% risk. Now, that looks really bad. The core argument really ever since this study came out is correlation is not causation, okay? This is the core of the cannabis um, industry's argument. 
this doesn't prove anything. Well, Dr. Andreessen was well aware that correlation all by itself doesn't prove causation. There are two, there's a second argument which I'll get to in just a bit. But, so, so he looked at various confounding factors. Did you have a family history of mental illness? Did you have symptoms of you know, depression or other mental illness at the time? Did you have other drug use? And once he factored all those down, uh, or all those out, this ratio went down. Okay, so, so it is clear that cannabis use is confounded by other factors, but it didn't go away. What he found was that if you'd use more than 11 times before you were 18, you had double the risk of somebody who'd, used, who'd never used. So, so this, this has been a finding in the literature over and over and over again. Once the, the, the crude risk is off the charts, but there clearly is some self-medication and confounding happening. In other words, it is definitely true that people who are becoming mentally ill, a lot of them will tend to use drugs or alcohol to, to try to make themselves feel better because it probably doesn't feel very good if you are slipping into psychosis, if you don't know what's happening. And you, know, and you start to think that all your friends are out to get you or you're starting to wake up in the middle of the night hearing voices. And so people do tend to self-medicate. There's no question about that. But even once you account for the confounding factors and the potential reverse causation, you still see a risk. So this is a, this is a really elegant study that came out in 2002. And what this said was, so this, this follows a group of people um, in a city called Dunedin in the, on the South Island of uh, New Zealand. Um, and these, this is about a thousand kids, you know, now they're 50 years old, but they were followed from uh, the early 70s until, they're still being followed today, actually. What's so interesting about this is that, is that the scientists were interviewing these kids practically every year, and maybe every other year in their childhood. And at one point, when they were 11, a psychologist came in and asked them about whether or not, you know, do you think your friends can put thoughts in your mind? sort of prodromal symptoms of psychosis. Do you think, uh, you know, you, everyone's talking about you all the time? So, so questions that, uh, you know, that, that, that hopefully wouldn't alarm an 11-year-old, but would give uh, a professional reason to suspect that maybe somebody was having strange thoughts. So, so, so this is a study that's prospectively collected data, in other words, data in advance of the outcome, where we know what happened to, we know whether which kids were having these strange thoughts, and we know four years later if they were using cannabis and or other drugs. And so, so again, what you see is that even after you control for the psychotic symptoms at age 11, if you were using cannabis at age 15, you had about a three times the risk of developing either schizophrenia or other uh, lesser psychotic disorders. Um, so, and this came out last year, um, uh, and this has a 5x rate ratio, even after accounting for confounders. So this is out of Europe, uh, and it looked at more than 1,000 people who developed psychosis. Um, they, they were compared to people uh, in the community, and uh, their use of cannabis was stratified, along with other stuff. You don't need to understand necessarily all the details of all the studies to understand this. There is a lot of evidence linking cannabis to severe mental illness. And the scientists who've been looking at it have been very careful to look at correlation and causation. Okay, it, it, the, there, there is simply no question, by the way, that cannabis can cause transient psychotic episodes. I mean, uh, that, that's, that's enough of a feature of cannabis use that uh, you know, cannabis magazines will write about it. What happens if you get really paranoid? I mean, half the time they tell you to put ice in your hands or eat black pepper or do a lot of other stuff that probably is not gonna work if you're really getting psychotic, but I guess you know, they have to tell people something. So cannabis can certainly cause transient psychosis and does very frequently. And it sends people to the ER very frequently. There, the other piece of original research in Tell Your Children is I was able to look at billing data uh, between 2006 and 2014, and what I found, uh, hospital billing data, this is federal hospital billing data, was that the incidence of people going to the ER and being diagnosed with a psychotic uh, disorder had risen 50% in those six years. Um, and the 
And the incidence of people going to the ER and being diagno diagnosed with a psychotic disorder who were also heavy cannabis users had tripled. So it went from 30,000 to 90,000. And by 2014, and unfortunately, I have not run the data to see what's happened since 2014, um, although I suspect that things have only gotten worse. By 2014, there were 90,000 times in the United States, so that's about 250 times a day, when somebody went to the ER and was diagnosed with a psychotic illness and was a heavy cannabis user. And about one and a half percent of the population is a heavy cannabis. By heavy cannabis user, I mean somebody who was diagnosed with cannabis use disorder. So, so that's 11 percent of the people who showed up in ERs, less than two percent of the population. So cannabis can definitely cause transient psychotic episodes. There's no question about that. Um, whether or not it can cause schizophrenia, I would say, I would say the evidence is quite strong. I would say there are legitimate questions about that. Okay, there are people who can argue that it's not going to permanently make somebody schizophrenic who wasn't going to become schizophrenic before. I don't, I don't agree, but, but that's a legitimate case to make. Um, that, that, you know, that, and, and, and by the way, now that we have the, sort of all this case control data, all this epidemiologic data, the best argument for that is, well, hey, you know, Alex, all these people are smoking. So, you know, we've seen so much more cannabis use in the United States in the last, uh, you know, 15 years. How come we haven't seen a huge increase in the number of people diagnosed with schizophrenia? That's a good question. The answer to that question may be that we don't know who, uh, how many people. I mean, we, the answer, we definitely don't know how many people in the United States get schizophrenia. So it may be that the number is actually increasing and increasing significantly, and we just don't know it yet. And there's some fragmentary evidence uh, of that, but uh, you know, I could spend another 10 minutes talking about that, and I've already been up here for more than half an hour. Um, so, so I'm not going to go. I'm not going to go into any detail about cannabis and violence. Um, I just want to say one one thing about this: the, the cannabis violence issue is very controversial. It makes the cannabis mental illness issue look uh, like everybody is happy and, and singing kumbaya. People hate, cannabis advocates hate the notion that cannabis might be linked to violence. They mock anybody, especially me, who talks about it. However, there's good reason to believe it's true, mainly because we know, oh, so by the way, this, so I should have shown you the slide already, here, that's the NASM paper from 2017. In August, the Surgeon General of the United States said higher doses of THC are more likely to produce anxiety, agitation, paranoia, and psychosis. Marijuana use is also linked to a risk for an early onset of psychotic disorders such as schizophrenia. That's not me. That's the US Surgeon General. Okay? And, and I believe that in years to come, this is going to be viewed as the equivalent of the 1964 Surgeon General's warning about tobacco and cigarette, uh, tobacco and lung cancer, okay? We're gonna look back on this and say he was right, because he is right. Um, and unfortunately, 64 didn't settle the question because the cigarette companies spent a lot of money on marketing and hiring friendly scientists and PR, and they, and they basically muddied the waters for 20 years. And then it took 10 more years for us to do something about it. So it really wasn't until the 90s that, that we really mounted a response to cigarette companies. And I, I, I hope that you know, in 2049, we are not still fighting about this. But unfortunately, we might be, because there's money on the other side. And, and the idea that you can trust uh, cannabis companies or, or the people on the academic, you know, in academia who they sort of bought off or ideologically uh, you know, convinced that this is not a public health issue, but an you know, issue of uh, social justice or the other things they like to say about it. Um, we may still be arguing, but this is what the Surgeon General said. So lots of studies about, about cannabis and violence. Here's, here's just, if you take away one, one point on the cannabis violence issue, it's this. People with severe mental illness, people with psychotic disorders, are unfortunately a lot more likely to be violent than the general population. We don't like to talk about this. We don't like to stigmatize people with severe mental illness. And I totally understand that. When we don't talk about it, when we pretend it's not real, 
we put the family members of people with severe mental illness at risk because they're the ones who are most likely to be impacted by violence. It's not strangers. It is, unfortunately, it's, it's, it's first responders and it's family members. Um, and those people are at risk. Now, I want to be very clear about this. If you have schizophrenia and if you are taking your antipsychotic medicine and you're taking care of yourself and you're in treatment and you're not using recreational drugs, most importantly, if you're not using recreational drugs, your violence risk is not that much higher than the average person. And fortunately, average people are not that likely to get violent. Um, driving on 93 notwithstanding. Um, uh, the problem is that, again, mental, people with mental illness don't like taking antipsychotics. People with schizophrenia, antipsychotics are not fun drugs. They're, they and the antidepressants are the only brain drugs that people don't like taking because they don't get you high. They're not intoxicating. And in fact, they have severe metabolic side effects. They make a lot of people, uh, you know, have they mess up. You can get you can get very f overweight. You can have uh, you know glucose problems. You can have diabetes. Antipsychotics are not good drugs, and people with schizophrenia don't like taking them. And when they don't take them, and they begin to decompensate, which you know is a, psychi a psychiatric term, um, they oftentimes wind up taking recreational drugs. And the recreational drug they take the most is cannabis. But unfortunately, cannabis is a really bad drug for them to take because it provokes paranoia. And if you are, if you are prone to becoming paranoid, a drug that provokes paranoia is a bad idea, which is why you know, the, the, the crimes that, the, crimes that the most horrific crimes, and I've read way, way too many horrific crimes in the last couple of years, are those with cannabis and mental illness and cannabis methamphetamine and mental illness because methamphetamine also provokes paranoia in its users. And you know, the one good thing about cannabis from a violence point of view is that um, it, you know, it, it does tend to knock a lot of people down, um, but methamphetamine counteracts that. So you know, it, this is a bad combination. A cannabis and stimulants are a really bad combination in people who are mentally ill. And unfortunately, some of them use. And so, so what this says is that A, people with schizophrenia are more likely to be violent than healthy people, and B, that the violence is concentrated in extreme violence. So, so people with schizophrenia are not that much more likely to get into a fight, um, you know, a common, a common assault, as, you know, as the police say, but they are 20 times, 20 times as likely to commit homicide. Um, and you know, that's just a number that we just don't like to talk about. But a lot of it is, is comorbid to drug use. And, that, and the drug that it is most comorbid to is cannabis. So, so this is why there's a, there's a very plausible case that cannabis use is, is driving severe violence in, in a subpopulation, but, but it's, a real, it's a real issue. So anyway, I will, I will, uh, I will leave you so this, came, this just came out uh, two days ago. And um, what it says is that since uh, between 2004 and 2016, this is not a total US sample, but it's a number of states. And this is from a peer reviewed paper. Um, we don't, when, when you read that alcohol causes 8,000 homicides or 6,000 homicides or 7,000 homicides a year, that's basically an epidemiologic guess. And it's not actually based on testing somebody who's been arrested to see if they're, if they're drunk. First of all, most arrests aren't up for homicide or not made immediately. And second of all, um, we, don't, you know, we don't routinely test people uh, for alcohol uh, you know, or, or other drugs after they've been arrested for a crime. Um, we test the victims. We test the victims of homicide. And, so, and we use that number to generate the alcohol attributable, uh, you know, homicide number. What this says is that in 2016, there were more people who had THC in their blood than alcohol who were victims of homicide. Now, that, now I'm not saying that that means that there are 8,000 homicides in the United States caused by THC. But if you're going to calculate the number the same way we calculate the alcohol number, that's sort of the conclusion you have to reach. And, and by the way, there, there's, there's problems with this data 
and I don't want to go into them in, in detail. If somebody really wants to quiz me on it later, I'm, I'm happy to do it. But the point is, the point is, there's a lot of violence that has THC in it, whether, whether that's psychosis related, whether that's uh, you know, cannabis dealing related, or whether it's this situation where the victim has THC in his or her blood. And, and we have totally closed our eyes to that. We all know that alcohol can cause violence, and anybody who's been in a bar at 9 p.m. and then gone back at 2 a.m. knows that alcohol disinhibits people, and it can escalate fights, and it can cause domestic violence. All of that is true. But we have just closed our eyes to this fact that, that cannabis is also an intoxicant, and although it doesn't, it doesn't escalate fights, I don't think, necessarily the way that alcohol does, because it can cause paranoia and psychosis, and it so often does, even at subclinical levels, it can cause violence that way. Um, and then, this is just going back to the driving, I will leave you with this. Uh, there were 500 more driving deaths in the first four states that legalized in 2018 than 2013. Um, now, overall, uh, driving deaths did increase in that time, but not nearly as much. Um, that is the equivalent of uh, three Boeing Maxes going down, uh, an extra three Boeing Maxes in those states in 2018. We grounded the Boeing Max worldwide uh, because two planes went down and killed 300 people, but in four states, 500 more people died post-legalization and nobody's paid any attention. Um, so, so I thank you all for coming and, uh, and listening to this very uplifting uh, presentation. Um, and I'm happy to take uh, whatever questions you might have. Um, and, uh, and, and I thank Sagal. So, and, and, and if nobody has questions, I'm just gonna keep talking, which you don't want. Oh, sure. Um, so, uh, the, the question was, can I talk a little bit about the, uh, about the media? And, and, and by the way, Tony, you, do you want? Sure, sure. Um, um, I don't know how. Sure. Um, Tony's going to make copies of bibliography for anybody who wants to uh, want one. Um, uh, so yes, so why, why is all this such a shock, right? Why do I sound like such a nut for telling you stuff you've never heard before? Um, uh, so there's been a very, very successful campaign to frame legalization and cannabis generally as a racial and social justice issue, more than anything else. There have been two, two big lies. There's been other smaller lies, but the two big lies about cannabis are one, that uh, there's a tremendous number of people in prison for uh, you know, possessing or, or, or dealing it, which is, which is not true. There are a lot of arrests made around cannabis, and those arrests definitely are, there's definitely a racial justice, or there's definitely a racial disparity in those arrests. There's no question about that. Um, but there are very, very few people in prison for cannabis use. Um, uh, uh, and, and, and the people who are in prison for long sentences for dealing deal in the, you know, in the, in some cases, the ton. Right? You, have to, you have to deal a lot of cannabis to be in jail for, I mean, there are exceptions, but for the most part, you have to deal a lot to be in jail, uh, to be in prison for any significant length of time. But you have to sort of drill down into the numbers to get there, and the cannabis lobby has sold um, two journalists who, you know, for the most part, and I can say this is a New York Times reporter, uh, you know, are on the left. Um, uh, they've sold this as an issue of racial and social justice. Um, and, there are, and I wouldn't disagree that there are racial and social justice aspects to this issue, but the fact is, A, again, almost nobody's in jail for cannabis uh, possession, certainly, and B, uh, uh, even if all cannabis arrests ended tomorrow, the system would operate pretty much as it is. Cannabis is, is, not, it is not the tail wagging the dog, it's, you know, it's barely even the tail on this. The system runs as it runs, and cannabis arrests are one part of it. But, but the cannabis lobby has very, very successfully sold this. And at the same time, they have hugely overstated the benefits of cannabis as medicine, which are very, very limited. And, and, they, have been, and they say, the reason we don't know why cannabis is such an effective medicine is because we haven't been able to study it, which is a lie. Okay, they've actually been saying that for 50 years. For 50 years, people in the cannabis community have said that. First of all, yes, it is 
at this point, it's not hard to research cannabis. You know, it's so hard to research it that the, that the University of California has two centers for medical cannabis research. But even when it was hard to research in the US, it wasn't hard to research in Britain, it wasn't hard to research in Israel, it wasn't hard to research in Europe. And so the reason that cannabis isn't a, doesn't seem to have a lot of medical uses is because it doesn't have a lot of medical uses. It's, it's a plant that gets you high, okay? It's an intoxicant. And that's, if we're ever gonna legalize it, that's how we should, should have legalized it. And that's how we should legalize it. I'm not in favor of legalizing it that way, but the notion that it's medicine is, is, is the worst lie of all the lies that the legalization community has told because it has encouraged people with mild psychiatric disorders and, and people under 21 to use when they are the people we should be explicitly discouraging from using. If you have depression or anxiety, this is not gonna treat you in the long run any more than beer is, okay? It's not, it's not a medicine in that way. So, 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 they've, so they've lied about the, the the criminal justice issues, they've lied about the medical issues, and they haven't even necessarily lied about the, uh, uh, the mental health and psychiatric risks, they've just ignored them and yelled reefer madness at anybody who brings them up. And the only people who've known uh, are the psychiatrists. And you know, psychiatrists haven't wanted to get that involved in this issue. Um, I think they're being forced to now because high THC cannabis, and this is another fact, cannabis has become much, much more potent in the last 20 years. And, uh, you know, the, the, the stuff that, you know, wax or shatter or, you know, or edibles, that's essentially pure THC. So people say it's just a plant. This is a semi-synthetic product that's extracted from, from cannabis leaves or, uh, you know, or other junk parts of the plant with butane. Okay, it's about as much of a plant as, you know, it is to, it is to a cannabis plant as heroin is to the poppy. Okay, it's not, it's not, it's not a plant anymore. Um, and one, you know, one, one thing that I should, have, uh, I should have said was, you know, I think there's a real parallel here to, uh, to both to opioids and tobacco, okay? Tobacco's been around a long time. People have smoked tobacco for a long time. Tobacco didn't kill that many people before 1900, okay? It's not tobacco that causes lung cancer. It's cigarettes that caused a mass epidemic of lung cancer and death in the United States and across the world. We weaponized tobacco and we have weaponized cannabis. We've turned it into from, a, you know, from a plant that can definitely cause problems for people, some people if they use too much, to something that is, extreme, that is near pure THC that can wreck people's minds in some cases in a matter of months. And that's actually happening. That is not me saying it. It's actually happening in the psychiatric, you know, psychiatrists are seeing this now. So, and, and just, We've, and we've done this at the behest of the same people who encouraged us to think of opioids as pretty safe and not, and not that, uh, you know, with, with controllable side effects. 25 years ago, the US and Europe were using prescription opioids at almost the same level. And the US didn't have a massive opioid epidemic, okay? We were told that there was some epidemic of untreated pain in the United States, and the way to fix that was with prescription opioids. And that has been the worst public health decision since tobacco in the history of the United States. And we are still fixing it. And some of the very same people, the, the, literally the same people who were pushing that are now pushing cannabis. Cannabis legalization, cannabis as a cure for opioids. And, but it is the failure of my people, journalists, to be skeptical that has allowed all of this to happen. When I got into journalism, I, I, the, the, I, it, is, it, sounds, it sounds silly and uh, you know, uh, apocryphal, but my editor actually said to me, if your mother says she loves you, check it out. You're supposed to be skeptical. You're supposed to push back. And you're really supposed to push back from people when they have a financial interest in the product that they're selling. And why it is that after 50 years of seeing cigarette companies lie about the products they're selling, and 25 years of Purdue Pharma lie about the product that it's selling, we think that Curo Leaf and these other, these other entrepreneurs are, are on our side is beyond me. But until, uh, so right now, it, it was just me. Now it's me and this reporter at USA Today, Jan O'Donnell, um, and, and a couple, you know, and there's a couple other people who are looking. But until the media wakes up and starts seeing this as a public health issue, it's gonna be a, a tough slog.
it's, it's, I mean, it's not, it's not as if, you know, the editor of the Globe is, is saying, you know, is taking payoffs from somebody and, you know, and deciding. It's, it's more, it's more, it's more just, it's a little bit of advertising and a lot of ideology. So, so cannabis, you know, legalization is cool, right? It's been cool for a long time. And there's nothing sadder to me than seeing middle-aged white men, and I say this as a middle-aged white man, falling all over themselves to prove how cool they are because they, they believe in legalization and you know, they tried edibles for the first time or they got high for the first time in 15 years and they wanna, you know, they wanna tell you about it. My secret weapon in this fight is I don't care what you say about me and I don't need to prove that I'm cool to you. I know what the science says and it's more important to me. But there are unfortunately a lot of middle-aged white journalists, white men, trying to prove their cultural relevance here. And, 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 you know, and when you combine that with the, you know, it's sort of like the 20-somethings who, uh, you know, who I call on Twitter, you know, much to, it doesn't make anybody happy, but I call them the journo children because they don't have children, they don't really, and they haven't really, you know, covered crime or war or anything serious, and they may use occasionally um, and, you know, and they did go to, you know, a lot of them went to fancy schools and they, you know, they sort of don't really know anybody whose lives have been blown up from use. Um, when you combine the sort of middle-aged white guys with the journo children, you get a lot of people who don't really know what the science is, who think they're a lot smarter than they are writing stories that are nonsense. So, so that's a great question. I have not talked to uh, Dr. McCann's cats. I know that she's read the book, uh, actually, because Jane O'Donnell mentioned to me that she had. Um, uh, there are a couple, you know, uh, Jerome Adams, the Surgeon General. Um, there's a, the Chief Medical Officer at the Office of National Drug Control Policy. There are physicians, you know, real MDs, at the top of the government who are paying attention to this issue. Uh, I think. I think, you know, that they're aware that, I think that opioids are the number one crisis, and, and they have to be. Opioids are killing a lot of people, but I think that, I think that there's an increasing awareness that there's real danger here, and that, uh, you know, frankly, on a couple of different levels. One is that our psychiatric health system doesn't have a lot of give to it, and, um, and you know, if, if, if this is as bad as, it, you know, as some of the individual studies suggest that it could be, um, we, we really are headed for a very, you know, expensive, painful crisis that's going to wreck a lot of young people's lives and wreck a lot of families. I mean, one, one thing about psychosis is it really, and schizophrenia, it destroys families. I mean, the, the stories that I hear from parents, you know, people say, well, the worst thing that can happen to a parent is losing a child to opioids. It's actually not true. The worst thing that can happen to a parent is having a child become so mentally ill that they wind up on the streets and waiting for the call that, that you know, he's killed somebody else or killed himself. And, and you know that that is that that is a those are tragedies you know that I can't even comprehend as a parent, and you know I think there's awareness out there, but right now the public health authorities are so focused on opioids. Sorry, sorry. Let me give to. Uh, yes, I know that she's. I know she's gone. Yes. Uh, yeah, I think it's an ideological issue for them. Um, you know, Soros is generally uh, pretty liberal and uh, he sees it as a criminal justice issue. Some of the other uh, big donors uh, are users um, and, they, and they haven't had problems with it. Uh, you know, Peter Lewis is famously a user. Uh, so I, 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 I tend not to, you know, I, I don't think it's greed for them. You know, there, there are certainly people in the industry who are very greedy. and. Um, you know, for better or worse, it looks like a lot of those people are not making the money that they, I mean, I, from my point of view, it's for better. They're not making the money that they thought they were gonna make um, uh, because it turns out that if you legalize, you have two choices. You can either run a really restrictive regime uh, like, like Massachusetts does and California does, and in that case, you get undercut by the illicit market or you run a pretty permissive regime like Oregon does and Colorado does, in that case, its prices go way down. Um, so either way, the licensed operators actually have a fairly hard time um, 
making as much money as they thought they were going to make. Um, but, but, you know, I, I think Soros just, I think he's a, he's a very liberal guy. He's very into criminal justice reform. And he views this as, a, as part of that. Uh, oh, sorry. United States and Great Britain are culturally similar. And you cited in the book that uh, in 2001, um, the push for legalization of cannabis was roughly 50, plus 55, plus 50 percent. And 10 years later, it's at roughly 30. Why, why is that happening? Um, I, you know, I think, again, I think the, the industry and the, the Drug Policy Alliance, other marijuana policy project, there were very well-funded groups that, um, that figured out how to message around this, and they did so aggressively. Um, and and, and it's, it's also true that in the UK there is this, you know, there's this group called the Institute of Psychiatry, Psychology, and Neuroscience in London that talked a lot about this issue. Um, and so, you know, people, people do pay attention. I, you know, I, I, I hear a lot, and I'm thinking about sort of writing a, uh, if I write a follow-up book, it will not be about cannabis only, it will be sort of about the bigger issues around drugs and, uh, and drug you know, reform and drug legalization. But there's this idea that we can't stigmatize. You know, that's a big thing. We don't want to stigmatize anybody who uses. We don't want to discourage use because that stigmatizes people who use. Well, we stigmatized cigarette smoking, and that really worked. And we stigmatized drinking and driving, and that really worked. But somehow, we can't stigmatize cannabis use. Um, you know, God, uh, God forbid we tell people that they shouldn't smoke or that they might become mentally ill if they smoke or they might, you know, forget, forget the violence thing or that, you know, that it's not really that safe to drive or that it's really not safe to do in your teens. Um, we, you know, we don't want to discourage the little darlings. But we do tell people they shouldn't smoke cigarettes and they listen. Um, you know, vaping notwithstanding. Vaping, unfortunately, it's pretty clear that you can push people. You can push people to do, you know, jewel. Very effective, very cool. You can push people to do stuff that's cool, and you can push people away from stuff. And we seem to have forgotten that lesson. Um, and we certainly have forgotten it when it comes to cannabis. Uh, so, you know, I, I don't know how long it's going to take for the pendulum to swing back. I don't know how many people are going to have to be destroyed. I, I hope it's not that many. Um, you know, unfortunately, the experience of cigarettes suggests that it can take a long time. Um, and a lot, you know, there can be a lot of consequences before people uh, start taking them seriously. So the evidence around PTSD is very mixed, um, uh, you know, and there, there's, there's actually the better studies show that it worsens PTSD, which over time, which is not surprising to me because PTSD is a psychiatric condition, and just as with you know depression and anxiety and sort of the mild psychiatric conditions, getting high is going to make you feel better for a little while, right? The the question is whether it's a, it's a good solution long term, right? Um, I mean, my joke about this, which is not really even a joke, is, it, it, you know, if you look at, because I used to cover the FDA for the time, so I, you know, I still follow the pharmaceutical industry, there's a lot of essentially um, recreational drugs being repurposed right now as antidepressants. Ketamine, uh, uh, there's, a, there's a drug called uh, DXM, um, which is in trials. Uh, there's a company right here in Boston called Sage that has a, what is basically a benzodiazepine in trial. If you, if you structure your trials well enough, in the, in the short term, and for four, like 14 days, you can show people almost anything is going to, you know, people, things that get people high are going to help with their depression. Because I, I could probably give you cocaine for 14 days, and it would help for, you know, you feel less depressed at the end of the 14. You know, a month later, much less six months later, maybe not so much. But so, so there's a lot of problems around clinical trials in general for intoxicants for psychiatric conditions. And 
And I think the, the trials around PTSD, the better ones, the longer term ones, um, actually show more negative outcomes over time. But you're right, veterans have gotten convinced of this, at least some veterans. And the, and the industry, which is very clever and you know, very good at selling personal narratives, gets, you know, gets veterans who may have benefited or, or who believe they've benefited to tell their stories. Um, one of the things that I think and slash hope may happen over time is that you know, all this data is, is wonderful, but one story from, a, you know, I gave my six-year-old THC and her seizure stopped, even though there's no evidence that that works in the long run, that, that, that really, uh, that really you know, changes people's minds. Well, now there are parents out there who can say, my teenager started, you know, my 18-year-old son went to college. He'd never had a psychiatric problem before in his life. He started smoking, and six months later, he was locked up. Because that's happening now. So, so there's going to be personal stories on both sides of this now. Um, but you're right, the veterans, uh, it's from, to my mind, the, the industry cynically used the veterans. I understand why veterans are looking for relief, and I understand why some of them think uh, you know, cannabis may help them, but the, the science is not really there. Uh, well, well, thank you, thank you. Oh, sorry, yes, ma'am. I mean, I, I think, you know, you make a really good point. And, and I, I trend not to try to talk about CBD because even though it seems like I want to argue about everything, I actually don't want to argue about everything. But, but the industry is incredibly cynical about this too, right? So CBD is not THC, right? And, and people who are using cannabis and THC are using it to get high, okay? But the industry will look at um, and when I say the industry, I mean the for-profit companies, I mean there's places like Marijuana Moment, you know, there's all these newsletters, Leafly, these places that, that exist as sort of amplifiers of, of the, the industry that are supposedly semi-neutral journalists. So a study will come out, and it will, in some cases, literally be on rats. So you give, you know, you give CBD to rats, and then you run them through a, a maze that's designed to test their anxiety, and they seem to have less anxiety. So, that gets reported as cannabis shown in lab studies to improve anxiety. Not CBD, not rats, cannabis shown to improve anxiety. And so, so when, you know, when grandma or mom is at CVS and sees the you know, CBD oil, and then her 18-year-old son says, yeah, yeah, I'm getting high every day, but like, it's helping me with my anxiety, she, you know, she may be much more disposed to, to agree to that. You know, if he said, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm waking up every morning and, you know, and doing two shots of vodka before I go to school because that helps my anxiety, you know, she wouldn't put up with that, even, even if it did help his anxiety temporarily. But, but cannabis, THC, CBD, they're confusing to people. People have mortgages to pay, people have lives to live, and they're getting a lot of bad messaging from the media, and so they don't have the, they don't have the, the knowledge or the resources to push back necessarily until it gets bad. Um, so I, you know, I don't have a great answer for you because the CBD horse is sort of out of the barn, right? It, it, you know, and I, I, think, I think if the FDA had its way, uh, there'd be a lot more testing required on some of these products, and there'd be a lot more, um, uh, <sighs> There'd be, uh, there'd be a lot more restrictions on the messaging, but they're, they're, they're struggling to catch up. 
And from my point of view, THC is so much worse. So, I mean, THC is really psychiatrically damaging that I, you know, I, I can't focus on CBD, but I agree with you, it's a, it's a problem. Yeah, it's, it, it's just nonsense. Um, I mean, it's, I mean it, you know, it's, it's, it's just not true, right? Contemporaneous accounts. People, people have known how to test THC content since the 60s. It's not hard. You, you know, you get a, a gas chromographer for, and you, which I probably just mailed that, but um, you, you, you run it through and you see the various chemicals in the leaves, right? Um, and, and, and the, you know, I, there's this notion that somehow the stuff was old and decayed and the University of Mississippi didn't know how to test for it. It's nonsense. People, people have known how to test the THC content of cannabis for a long time and they've done it and cannabis wasn't very strong in the, in the late 60s, early 70s. And by the way, there was stronger cannabis, right? Users are very aware of what they're buying. So there was a premium placed on cannabis grown in Colombia or grown in Thailand that had higher THC content. Even in India, in the 1800s, before they knew what THC was, they knew that some cannabis was stronger than other cannabis. They had different names for it. And they agreed, by the way, that what they called bong, the low potency cannabis, ditch weed, st you know, st seeds and stems, was not as likely to cause mental illness. That resin, which, you know, uh, which, which they call ganja, resinous cannabis, and, and hashish, which they called charas, we're more likely to cause mental illness. So, it, they're, so these people are just, they're just wrong, okay? They, they, you can, sometimes I go, sometimes it's very frustrating to me because this is one of these lies that, that any time you say this on Twitter, 18 people will say what you just said. And, it, but it comes up in various forms. So, so I'll say, there's a new study out of Canada where they looked at 600,000 births and they looked at the mother's cannabis use in those births. And they adjusted for cigarette use and social economic status and stuff that affect birth weights and NICU visits and fetal death. And they found that cannabis use uh, was statistically significantly associated with an increase in all of those things. Okay? This is real research. And somebody will say, what about the Jamaican study from 1994? Okay, the Jamaican study from 1994 is so bad that an MIT magazine, science magazine, last year actually wrote a whole piece about it, telling, and I didn't even know all this stuff. This looked at 44 children, okay? It was done by a, 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 a sociologist who went down to Jamaica, and it is so bad on so many levels, it would take me another hour just to walk you through all the problems with it. But even if it weren't bad, it covered 44 people in Jamaica 25 years ago. We have a study from 600,000 people that came out last year. Those two things, it's not like this, it's like this. But people always have an answer. And I, I mean, I, I, was, I, I was saying this to Segal before we started. The saddest part of this for me, so I was a New York Times reporter, okay? I was, uh, you know, I, I'm a registered political independent. I, you know, I tend to lean Democratic. Um, I, as I said to the governor of Nebraska a few weeks ago, I said, I've been in rooms with more Republican office holders than has been healthy for a New York Times reporter this year, okay? So, the saddest part of this for me is realizing that this, to some extent, is the left's version of climate change, okay? Not that it's as serious as burning up the whole planet, but it's a very serious issue with real consequences for a lot of people. And the question is, when the science doesn't agree with your ideological position, what do you do? And the left always says, we're the ones who care about science and truth except they don't care about science and truth about this because it's painful for them to admit that there might be real problems here and that legalization, if it comes at all, should come with really strong warnings and public health messaging and maybe shouldn't happen at all. Okay, so, so, they, so instead of confronting the real issues, they just want to shout at people who bring them up. So in, back in January, the DPA, this is a year ago, this is when all this started, I said to the DPA, the executive director of the Drug Policy Alliance, this is, we had this long email conversation, what warnings do you think are appropriate here? 
And you can think of specific warnings that might be appropriate, like if you've used cannabis and become severely paranoid, you shouldn't use again. That could be a sign that it is affecting your brain in really negative ways. If you have severe mental illness in your family, do not use cannabis. Do not use cannabis as a treatment for psychiatric disorders. Like, there, there are things we could say, even if we're going to legalize, that would make sense. But the DPA didn't want any of those. They are afraid because legalization hasn't happened yet that if they tell people the truth, it won't happen. And that, as far as I'm concerned, is too bad. It's not a reason not to tell people the truth. Right, right. I, I mean, I, no serious, there's, a, there's always an exception, but no serious psychiatrist would encourage somebody with, with severe, with psychosis of any kind to use cannabis. I mean, they, 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 they know. Um, uh, you know, would, they, would some encourage people to use it or say it's okay for people with anxiety and depression? Not, not the ones like my wife, not the forensic psychiatrist, right? But, you know, there, there might be some out there who, who, <coughs> Who, who would be okay with that. But no, you're right, for the most part, the doctors who prescribe cannabis, um, are, they're, they're a tiny fraction of the medical profession. So most doctors don't wanna write these authorizations and some states actually collected data on this. Um, uh, in Oregon, uh, you know, which this was before legalization, uh, there was one doctor who accounted for 35% of all the authorizations in Oregon for the first decade. These are people, they make a volume business out of it. You know, look, I, I really respect doctors. I do, I mean, I'm mean, married to one, like I see the training that they go through, but, but, but there are a few, they're bad doctors, like there's bad everything. There are doctors who've lost their licenses or are on the verge of losing their licenses for substance abuse or other problems. There are doctors who, you know, just are burned out. And, and some of those people go into the business of writing these authorizations. And, uh, and they do it, and, and some of them truly believe. Some of them are, some of them honestly are old potheads who truly believe that this is a magic, and, uh, and, they, and they want to write authorizations. But, but when I say the vast majority of doctors, and certainly the vast majority of psychiatrists aren't interested in doing that, the, the statistics bear that out. Uh, by the way, well, you know, if you don't mind my asking, what do you see with your patients who use? Do, you know, do they manage to keep their use under control? Um, I mean, I, I really don't relish, you know, I, I get to come up here and give a speech and go away. You have to deal with people in the community day after day, and, 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 and that is a really tough job. 
Right. So, I mean, clearly PCP is not a good drug to use. Um, I, mean, I will say that oftentimes uh, when people say it's laced, it's not laced. Now, th now, in this case, the person might well have been using both, but, but um, you know, high potency cannabis, certainly wax and chatter, those will get you as high, you know, you do not need K2 or spice if you're using those, uh, those drugs, um, and certainly if you're using a lot of them. And so the, the amount of PCP out there, in the, in the, if you actually look at sort of like US government statistics, it's, it's, it's minimal right now, a LSD also. And you know, the joke psychiatrists have is that if you wanna get, some, and I think I, Amy may have heard me say this before, but uh, if you wanna get somebody uh, to get psychotic, you should lace their LSD with the THC. Um, you know, the, 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 uh, you know, really, the people say it's laced oftentimes when it's, it's just not. Um, I thought there was a, maybe a question over here. Or, um, have you been asked to speak in the states like Massachusetts, a referendum state? And of course, you know, we followed the whole uh, procedure in public health and prevention with medical and then so, so So sadly, I usually get to speak, asked to speak in red states. Um, I don't, I, you know, I, um, it, it's been a real revelation. You know, who, who has me on TV? Fox has me on, right? You know, MSNBC won't have me on. NPR will not have me on. I mean, you know, regional NPR uh, stations have had me on a couple of times, but I was supposed to be on a national NPR station out of, a show out of Boston, and they canceled on me after making it with me because they said, quote unquote, they disagreed with the methodology and conclusions of the book. Now, first of all, I think anybody who hears me speak at length is gonna be hard put to say that I'm some crazy. Second of all, if you disagree with me, have me on, challenge me. I will take any question. You know, ask me who paid for the book. I'll tell you who paid for the book. Simon Schuster paid for the book. Ask me, you know, ask me about the studies. Ask me why I got into this. Ask me whatever you want. I'll answer it. They wouldn't have me on. So, so the, you know, the, the, the center left media has really not wanted to deal with this and they've really not distinguished themselves as far as I'm concerned. And, and to some extent that's happened, that's happened with the think tanks too. You know, I've spoken before the Hudson Institute and AEI and all these you know, right of center think tanks, but the left center ones, they won't have me, you know, they won't have me come. The Aspen Institute, TED, all these places that are, you know, supposed to be about free and open discourse, they don't want me on. So no, I, it, it's, uh, this is, I underestimated the amount of political polarization around this issue. I, I genuinely, look, I knew there were gonna be people who didn't like the book and who weren't gonna like me, but I thought the media would look at me and say, I was one of you, I still am one of you. I was a reporter for the New York Times for 10 years. I did not leave in disgrace, I left because I, I wrote a number one best-selling novel and then wrote 10 more, okay? That's why I left the New York Times, no other reason. Like, I would think that they would have me on, but they have not wanted to. Um, and that's been a source of frustration, and uh, yes. And we found that throughout the Commonwealth, it's a systemic thing, public health institutions, hospitals, you're not alone. Uh, I mean, I think Harvard is starting, there, there are people at Harvard who are starting to push. Um, uh, a little bit, and that's good. And you know, and Harvard's certainly a great brand, and it certainly does great work. And you know, to the to the extent that the psychiatrists and the addiction specialists and the MDs get involved, the sooner that happens, the better. Um, uh, and, and I think it's starting to happen, but it's just a slow process. Oh. I mean, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a good question, right? And, and I think, you know, there is this balance 
not so much with stigma. I'm, I'm fine, honestly, as I said, I'm like the last person in the United States who's fine with trying to stigmatize things and discourage people from doing them. It's just when all the messaging is so positive, if you tell people the truth and you don't walk them through it all, um, they'll just tell you you're crazy. Like you're just, you're just making it up. So you kind of have to walk them up to it. You know, you don't want to say cannabis can cause schizophrenia, even though that's, you know, I would say the weight of the science is there on that because it is so, it is so out there to people. Um, so, you know, can you tell people, hey, there are, you know, this is, this is an intoxicant and, you know, it's like, it's, like, it's like alcohol and you should think of it that way and you shouldn't think of it as a, uh, you know, as a, as a treatment. Now, some kids are going to be like, I know it's an intoxicant. I'm high on it right now, right? So, I, can you tell people, you know, what you've been told about driving in cannabis is not really true, that it can, you know, I mean, I think that's a message that might resonate. I, I'm not, I'm much better at diagnosing the problem than giving you good solutions. Um, uh, but but I, 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 I do think this idea that people won't listen to, to people who clearly have their public, to have their health at, at interest. And, you know, you're not some law enforcement officer, you know, you're not, you're, you're, you, I assume, want to do what's best for them, and I assume they know that. And so, so maybe you can, you can get some of them to listen just by being honest about some of the risks. I, I don't know, but, but I do know that stigma works. I do, because, because it worked for cigarettes and drunk driving and fetal alcohol syndrome and domestic violence. We've stigmatized domestic violence in this country, and, and my understanding is that, the, you know, it's, it's less common than it used to be. I mean, all forms of violence are less common than they were 25 years ago. So maybe methodologically you don't get there, I don't know. But we've definitely changed public attitudes towards that too. So you can, you can discourage behaviors, I, I hope. Um, I mean, I think that's an interesting point. I, I think, uh, you know, there, there are some trialers out there who are sniffing around this. I don't know that you could, I mean, I don't know the law about this, whether you could sue a state for a change that the voters have decreed. I would suspect that sovereign immunity protects a state from that. But, you know, why, why it is that you can't sue, or why it is that there have been lawsuits against the, you know, the med men of the world or the cure leafs of the world yet, um, I, I think those are coming. Uh, but they may not, it's not cigarettes yet in terms of the money. Um, and the truth is the trial lawyers like to, um, they like to sort of, they want the documents to come out first so that they can poke through them and see what's in them before they start the expense of a really big uh, lawsuit. But, but I think you're right, I think it's coming. There are two class action suits just started in the last two months on the CD. Somebody sent me that. CBD. And they're both 
mean, I, I, I mean, it's clear that cannabis causes societal disadvantage, right? Heavy use, right? I mean, but to some extent, I, you know, I didn't talk about it in the book because I think we all know that, right? You know, this idea that you're the, the stoner who doesn't get out of your you know, parents' basement until you're 30. Um, uh, you know, I, I, I think, unfortunately, that for whatever reason, that has not scared um, kids off. Uh, you know, I, why that is, a, I don't know. I mean, clearly, this is an addictive drug for a lot of people. Just you know, I mean, it's it's all you know. It's not as addictive as heroin or cocaine, but but it's it's addictive probably in the way that alcohol is addictive, and the high THC stuff might be more addictive than alcohol. And um, because it doesn't have you know so much physical liability associated with it, you can basically you know use it all day every day, and uh, and you sort of forget what it is not to be high anymore. Um, you know, there's, a, there's a, uh, a book coming out in a few months that I got sent an advanced copy of called Pothead by a guy who was like a very, um, you know, very heavy user and sort of one of these, he's a very smart guy, okay? And so was able to use basically all day, every day, and, um, and functioned and became a cannabis journalist, okay? And um, actually went on Jeopardy, believe it or not. He quit for six weeks before the Jeopardy competition. It was like six weeks of sobriety, and he won a couple of times. It's all in the book. Um, but, but you know, the, uh, the, the other 20 years of his adult life, he was high all the time. And it definitely impaired his, you know, psychosocial development. And so, but because he wasn't waking up with hangovers every day, he convinced himself that this was okay. Um, and you know, how you get people to see that this can be a problem for them, even if it's not leading to psychosis and, you know, and paranoia, uh, is hard. And the psychiatrists who I talked to about it say, you know, the word they use is insidious. It's an insidious drug because it isn't as physically harmful as alcohol. And because you, you, know, you can, and, and now it's very, very societally accepted. And you know, there's, a, there's a large group of people out there promoting its use. This, there's a cult around this drug that really doesn't exist around any other drug. And, and you know, people who wake up all day and drink all day, every day, we have a name for those people, okay? We call them alcoholics. And they don't usually talk about it. And people who use cocaine or, you know, certainly opioids, they probably don't talk about their use very much or proselytize their use very much except to, you know, except, you know, to other, to close friends or other users, okay? But people will happily tell you, almost unprovoked, that they smoke cannabis all day, every day, right? They, we have a name for it, we call them wake and bakers, and they wake and they get high. And, and I, don't, I don't understand how that became a thing, uh, but, but it did. And, and so it's gonna take a long time and a lot of work to convince people that it's not such a good idea. And, the, and, the, and again, the physical, the relative physical, um, you know, the fact that the drug is relatively physically uh, not damaging, although it certainly can be damaging. You know, there's uh, cannabinoid hyperemesis syndrome, aka scrometing, which is a real thing. Um, the fact that it's not that damaging to most people makes it relatively difficult uh, to fight on that basis. All right, I think, oh, have I exhausted everybody? Um, well, th thank you all. Um, and, uh, and, and grab a bibliography if you like.